Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another interview session with Nicole Batgirl D'Angelo. And I'm with David Lehman from Cloud Imperium Games, and he has agreed to meet with me today and talk a little bit about his work at CIG. Welcome to the show, David. How are you today? I'm doing pretty well. How about yourself? Doing wonderfully. Good. Um, I want to I want to jump right in with one question before I ask the typical ones. And um, I know that you were involved, are involved with doing the jump point for CIG, but recently came on in a different role. What currently are the titles that you hold in the company? The titles. Roles. Um, the jobs I have are, uh, you've pretty much just listed it, uh, I make sure jump point happens, uh, I make sure the brochures happen, and I'm working on with Ryan Archer on that, he's a uh, layout design artist, uh, and then I am working with, uh, as part of the design department, and I don't know what my title there is, I think design consultant, uh, but the principal responsibility I have is to provide a some sort of a board game, a paper game for our economy so we can test it out in broad strokes before we go into hours and hours of programming each individual element. Okay. So now we're going to get into the history questions and come back to that. I just wanted the viewers to know exactly what you do for CIG as we speak. <laughs> All right. So you have been in the industry for quite a while, in and out. Can you remember the first computer your family owned or that you owned? First computer that my family owned was the very first Mac, the Mac 128, uh, 128K. Okay. Uh, single floppy drive, uh, the system files and any program files all had to be on one 128K floppy. So that was early 80s. Early 80s, like 1984 on. It wasn't an Apple, it was a Mac, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And uh, did you at all ever game on a machine like that back then? Did a little bit. Uh, I, was, I had to go back uh, and look for some of the titles, but uh, some of the uh, old icon games, Uninvited Guest and Shadowgate and... The things that were just a step beyond the text games. Okay. I turned on my camera just so I could show you something. Did your computer look something like that? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Um, believe it or not, that's a There's working... A yeah, that's a working 30-year-old Mac. Uh, and I made sure I took the uh, serial number down. And I think it's going to be reversed when I show this up. But it was an M0001. Wow. And yeah, somebody dropped it off at a uh, recycle table at a Best Buy. And I was like, that's a working computer. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. it's working if, if you can find a floppy disk that still we, works. They gave us all the floppies, and one was stuck in there. We were actually able to get it out and boot the system. Congratulations. It was amazing. It was amazing. Yeah. Um, so did you get into computing gaming, computer gaming back then? Because it seems like you and I have a similar first computer experience. I was on <clears throat> the Commodores mm -hmm. and you were on the Apples, which were competing products back then. Yep, and there weren't many other options in addition to those. Uh, the first, ask your question again. We got sidetracked. All right. Do, did you game on that system or do any gaming back then? And, and that was some of the, the ICOM games. Uh, the, they were a step beyond text-based games. You had to investigate a, a black and white pixelated picture, and if you pressed on just the right pixel, you could uncover a clue or take a step forward. Yeah, there were a lot of adventure games that were born from that, and they just got more and more graphical as time went on. Mm -hmm. All right, so you're very quick with your answers. That's good. <laughs> um, what was the first game you can remember playing and loving at a early age of gaming? <laughs> I, I've been, you gave me a heads up on some of these questions. I've been thinking about that one. I, my passions were, were wide but shallow. I could spend all night on just about any game that I had at the time, but it was 
<laughs> that was that was just about all of them. So uh, I can I can't really call out one that that grabbed my attention above all else. Uh, I even then I was uh, basically independently employed. I was working out of a home office, and my best hours are at night. So I would often time spend all night playing a game at work. He said, at work. So there's nothing in particular you remember? No, not really. We're having pixelation and slow down over here, so I turned off my other computers. Um, okay. Well, it's like you're the first person to come on here and not mention one of Chris's games, which, you know, you know, a lot of my <laughs> games predate what I Chris love Commander. I did, no. Yeah. Uh, I... I had not heard of Wing Commander until I uh, started working with Origin Systems. I started working with Origin in 1991. Okay. It was just a few months after Wing Commander 1 had come out. In fact, it was before the, um, the add-on missions, I think, the, the secret missions. Secret missions, Disc 1. Yeah. Uh, and, in fact, one of the very first products I worked on at Origin was secret missions. Uh, what they hired me to do was the documentation, or to make sure the documentation happened. Uh, so other folks would write it, but I would make sure it got edited, make sure it got laid out, make sure that there was something that could go in the box by the time the box was ready to ship. And that was with, uh, with Chris's games, but it was also with the Ultima games and the Worlds of Ultima and the other non-Ultima, non-Wing Commander products. So all of the Jane's games that Origin Systems did, my team created the documentation for it. Holy cow. So that's a lot. That's very close to what you do today for yes. CIG. Yep. If not I, exactly the same thing. I, I have some show and tell if you want show and tell. Oh, I, I like show and tell because I've collected a lot of those uh, books over the years. I have the uh, Sudden Death Manual here, which is... Uh, and, and one of the things that... that I wanted to do and Origin wanted to do. In fact, Origin was doing it before I got there. I can't take credit for it. Uh, but it's very much in line with, uh, what, uh, with the way I like to do documentation is to use the, the manual as an element of immersion. So that, uh, for example, the manual for Strike Commander is Sudden Death. And it was uh, the manual of the mercenaries, the, the periodical, the magazine, for the mercenaries, uh, it had, in addition to all the game operation stuff, it had profiles on... Can you on hold it up just a little bit more so people could see? There we go. How's that? That's awesome. Profiles of the, of the various people uh, who you're going to meet in the game. Uh, the article on how squadrons are having trouble staying alive, staying uh, employed, uh, that type of thing. Uh, with Jane's, it wasn't so much, here's the, the longbow uh, manual, with Jane's it wasn't so much that we were creating uh, a fiction, because this was very much a real world game, but in addition to all the, the instructions, there was another 100, 200 pages of, uh, of articles about the, the world in which these, this equipment, these helicopters were flying. Uh, since it was Jane's, we had all the stats from, from Jane's on all the equipment that, uh, that you'd meet in the game. Uh, and all of this has my name on it, but I had a, I had a wonderful team uh, that was putting these materials together. Melissa Tyler, Tuesday Phrase, Chris McEvan, Jennifer Spore, uh, all of those folks went above and beyond in, in making the the documents happen and making them happen in time to release with the game. Okay. So back then you were really because the like you said, I, I when I bought a game I would go right for the manuals and read them. And a lot of times there were even other things in there like some fiction work and other pieces, right? Weren't there right. in the in the second two wing commanders there were a little bit more in there. There were ship layouts, crew, and the manual itself. Is that, right. And that's all something that you've worked on in the past. It, it was all some things that we worked on. I'd like to take credit for it, but I think it would have happened even if I weren't there. Uh, okay. There were some very... Uh, Chris, 
Chris was all about immersion from the very beginning. Yeah. Uh, and it's something that, uh, don't want to spend too long talking about origin, but their, their motto is, we create worlds. And right. it was about creating the world, not just a 10-hour game. Yeah, and something I miss, you know, EA has that, well, my opinion of EA is they take everything that's good and make it not so good. You don't have to answer or I comment on that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's just I've seen a lot of things come out of companies that they now own that have gone to poop, kind of like Microsoft. They take something over, rape and pillage, and throw it aside. But I, I thank you so much because... Those games, especially that Strike Commander game, now all I have is a digital copy I can go and look at, like in PDF form, mm -hmm. because I bought all of uh, Chris's old games on Good Old Games, and it yep. comes with the original uh, manuals, so when you download it, you can download just the game, and then separately all the manuals, and you get every single thing that you've probably been part of. So you've done... Did you do the Privateers also? Yes. And did you follow... Chris at all from there to Digital Anvil? Uh, just a little bit. The uh, the one thing I was uh, I worked with with, uh, with him at Digital Anvil uh, was the Wing Commander movie. Okay. Uh, and what we created for that was the official authorized Wing Commander Confederation handbook. Uh, wow. Which um, there we go. Looks like that. And this has. Uh, Sit reports on uh, the various. Uh, here's an interview with Admiral Talwin, uh, and is that all in universe? Like not. In it is. Let me. Let me. Before I. It is all in universe. Oh wow! Yes. Uh, it is uh, reports on the ships. I won't show you that because it's all text. Oh, here we go. Uh, the Concordia class supercruiser. Uh, awesome. The uh, and but then we have uh, people who died. A list of uh, of the fifty or sixty people who have died in action since the beginning of the war, from off of the uh, off of their carrier. Okay. Uh, a final evaluation of Lieutenant Christopher Blair, uh, and and that type of thing. Again, it was uh, by that time we were no longer. Origin employees, but we we're still Ink and Monkey God Studios, IMTS, yeah. and still the same team that was putting these materials together. Awesome. So that, a lot of what you do is the part that I like. It's like when they announced that you were going to be bringing a jump point in print, I was so psyched that I was part of the subscriber base to be able to jump on that quickly. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. What else? Sure. What else did you do in between Origin and coming to? Uh, um, CIG. That's a big space of time. The uh, I was at Origin uh, from '91 to '97, uh, and during that time, we put together our our publications team. And in '97, they decided that basically they wanted to move the documentation back out to California. Uh, there was very much a how many head count can we trim uh, process. And so we all decided to leave together rather than splitting up, and that's when Ink and Monkey Gut Studios was formed. Uh, it had been sort of an in-house group up to that point. But that was also, if you recall, when Ultima Online and EverQuest were just starting to make it big. Yeah. And we had gotten experience writing about the massive online games with Ultima Online, and we had been doing game guides and strategy guides for Origin System, but published by Prima Games. And when we went independent, we maintained our, our connection with Prima. And we basically, for a while there, were the, uh, the little studio that created all of their massive online game guides. So that got us into EverQuest and EverQuest 2. Dark Age of Camelot, Star Wars Galaxies, uh, the uh, Guild Wars, Lineage 2. Wow. Uh, I'm, and I'm overlooking some. Matrix. Matrix? How long may oh. it live? 
<laughs> yeah, long, yeah the, a couple of those aren't with us anymore, but I, uh, have, I probably have purchased many of those guides that you were involved with making. It's pretty good. Yep. And uh, what, like, how long ago did you and Chris and the rest, you know, when, when did you come to CIG to start your piece of it? The, uh, I knew that something was up, what, two years ago. Uh, I was at the, uh, at the conference where the announcement was made, but I can't say I was paying a lot of attention to it at that time. Uh, but a month or two later, uh, I've checked back on some of this back history because I wasn't involved with it. And uh, one of the things that was promised in that initial kickoff was a subscriber magazine, uh, a monthly magazine, short. And uh, that was something that I believe Ben Lesnick first proposed, and Chris got on board with it, of course, immediately. And Dave had a, uh, Dave, Ben, and Chris apparently were the ones who, who first conceived the thing. Uh, December 20th, I think, Wednesday night, midnight, Chris sent me an email asking me if I could make this happen by the end of Friday. Uh, and fortunately, a lot of the material existed. I just needed to get it pulled together into something that, that folks would want to read. Uh, and so we turned the first one around in about 30 hours, 45 hours, uh, and I started doing it from then on out. Wow. So, wow, you worked with a lot of people and then you wind up with Chris. Um, do you have any, I want to go back for a second because it just hit me that you've probably worked with Richard Garriott a little bit too. Oh yeah, the, uh, did, did all of the, when I came on they had just released uh, Ultima 6. Uh, so we were there for Ultima 7 and 8 and Ultima Online and uh, Serpent Isle and Martian Chronic, Martian something Martian yeah. Chronicles? <laughs> something like that. It, it, it amazes me that in this, you know, we're standing here in 2014, which is 30 years after this whole gaming thing started. Well, probably a little bit longer than that. But, mm -hmm. you know, when I look, look back to the 80s, 90s, it was Richard Garriott, it was Chris Roberts, it was Peter Molyneux, it was David Brad, I can't remember his name, from The Leap. And all mm -hmm. four of those people are bringing back the genres that they were responsible for back then. It's kind of amazing. I know that you're probably not up on that, but it's Peter Molyneux. Some of it I am, some more than others. Yep. Yeah, Peter Molyneux, who did uh, um, Populous and a lot of the black and white series, is bringing back Goddess. And, you know, David's bringing back Elite. And here's Richard bringing back an Ultima Online type game with uh, his. And Chris, you know, pretty much leading the pack in what we're doing <laughs> here. It's it's. For those of us that are Chris not is probably 20. making some of the other, yeah, Chris is probably making I'm not going to say some of the other possible, but some of the other easier. Uh, well, definitely to to get on with. Definitely by promoting him on the and, uh, and website. No, you can go. <laughs> and I've not worked with David, uh, but I actually have worked with Peter because Bullfrog was part of Electronic Arts there, and so we did yeah. uh, a handful of Bullfrog game guides as well. Yeah, they were they were a good company. I think one of the yes. games that they made that made me laugh a lot was Theme Hospital. Just listening to the PA <laughs> system in the game in the hospital was pretty funny. That that was good. The uh, uh, Dungeon Keeper uh, was the Dungeon one I Keeper? Was on most. Yes. Yeah, one of the better games that we've had. I I'd love to see something like that like that come back someday. Um, all right, so let's go back into here. So you you get. You know, an indication that Chris is doing this. You come on board. What was your initial thought process when you, you know, thoughts when they came to you? Who was it that came to you first, though? Was it Ben? Uh, to do Jump Point? Yeah. That was Chris. That was Chris. Uh, yeah, Chris, uh, obviously Chris and I, I knew each other. Ben, I was aware of. In fact, we corresponded a little bit, uh, okay. especially back when... Uh, he was collecting things for Wing Commander, and I was able to to help him track down some of the things that he wanted for those archives. Yeah. But but Chris is the one that I'd worked with a lot. Okay, and what was your initial thought when he came to you and told you about 
you know, what he wanted from you and about the project in general? Um, well, the first thought was that it had to be very quick and dirty. Uh, <laughs> you, you don't get something like that uh, laid out without saying, okay, we're going to do it this way this time and we're going to try to do it better next time. Um, uh, but it was, I mean, it's, it's an interesting world. And the whatever I can do to make it more interesting, all the better. But there's a lot of material there to work with. There's some very creative people cranking out, uh, obviously, the actual game design, but the fictional design, the, uh, the framework of the whole thing as well. Okay. And it gives, it gives me lots of material to work with. So, so you're pretty much like the final edit. I mean, the editor in chief of this, right? So you make the decisions. Sure, That's but Chris, I mean, <laughs> if somebody tells me to change something, it'll probably get changed. Uh, that I understand, but when I'm thinking about like you're in charge of production of Jump Point, yes, and other things that we don't see yet, like they're going to be things that they put in the collector's box set eventually. Yes. And those are things that should be kind of like not getting done, but they keep on giving you information for over time? Uh, somewhat. The, uh, I, until everybody wants this game to be done next week. I mean, everybody in-house would love if the game were done next week, and all of the players and subscribers and, and followers would, would love if it were done next week. But it's not going to be done next week, and collecting... The materials aren't ready to collect. Okay. I couldn't really, I mean, even, I'm not sure, uh, this this is just me talking, but I'm guessing that there is not a single ship that's in the form it will be in when the game releases. I, I mean, that some of it will be small, tiny tweaks, uh, but some of it will, I mean, look at what happened with the Idris just recently. Uh, if I'd collected stuff on the Idris last July... I pretty much would have to get rid of all of it. <laughs> well, you had to do another uh, jump point on it, right? Right. And that was two jump points on it, right? Or uh, sooner three. or later. Yeah. So that that was pretty pretty intense, and we've had already two jump points on the Hornet, right? Yes. And that's not done either yet. I mean, it's changed significantly since the last jump point issue. It, it all is giving me something to, uh, to keep myself busy with. Okay. So has anyone come to you about putting some of the fan and in-house fiction into a printable book? The well, there's actually two questions there, and I, let's let's talk both of them. Okay. Uh, with re every week, we have a a an episode in Spectrum Dispatch, right? Uh, about fifteen hundred words. Every month, we have an episode in Jump Point. Yes. That's though two or three times the length of a Spectrum Dispatch episode. Uh, that is coming from professional writers, but also it's going to be coming from our from the fans, and some of our fans are, as you probably have noticed, are very good writers as well. Uh, and this next jump point, the May jump point, will begin uh, our first fan written story. Okay. And all, of the, all of the stories in Spectrum Dispatch and Jump Point uh, are, are professional, we're paying for them, we're buying rights, it's, it's a real deal professional gig. Uh, and there are several of the fans who are good enough that we're commissioning them to write material for us, and the first one will be, as I say, will be coming out here at the end of the month. So, was there any thought or any decision made about collecting the fan stuff and putting it into its own publication? And that's the other half of it. Okay. Um, the this is this is absolutely not a knock about the fan fiction. Okay. But if it isn't thoroughly reviewed by by the folks in house, then we can't really put our stamp of yes, this is official Star Citizen material. Okay. And that again, that's not a knock about the quality of the writing at all. It's it's making sure the content fits within the universe. 
uh, even on the stuff we commission, from episode to episode, we are going to run across things that just don't exist in the universe and need to change in the fiction. Okay. So the continuity of between the real player universe and the fan fiction and the in-house fiction we're reading has a break in it at times. There, sometimes there's something in the fiction that will occur that will not be in the game, but as the game develops and we know more about the game, we will be keeping that from happening. In fact, uh, okay. for example, one of our early stories uh, had atmospheric combat, and Star Citizen will not have atmospheric combat. So if we had been thinking about that, been aware of that at the time, we wouldn't have allowed that in the fiction. Right. And that, and that I believe, is something that David has said, David Haddock has said in the developer's forums, that the fiction is there to bring interest into the universe, but not 100% to be things that happened. Right. And Yeah. Okay. That's I could, good. I could put together a list of things that we've included in stories that will not be in the game, <laughs> okay. but I just assume not highlight those things. <laughs> All right. So let's go back to the first issue of Jump Point. So you get commissioned to come in here and put it together, mm -hmm. and you made a statement that it had to be thrown together quickly, in essence, right? Could you tell me about that first issue? I didn't get much sleep. <laughs> um, it, I, I was up, it was, like I said, it was just after midnight on a Wednesday. Uh, Chris asked me, uh, I was in the middle of finishing up another project, uh, and Chris sent an email asking if I was interested, and I was glad I was still up because I was able to get uh, several hours of work done on it Wednesday night. Uh, it was, mm, I could go back and look and see what the articles are, I almost don't remember at this point, but, but several things were mostly done, most of the text was in, and it was a matter of creating a, a feel for the, the layout, uh, and getting the words on the page, and, uh, I'm remembering it more as, as we talk about it, getting Ben's pictures for that 24-hour uh, 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 recruiting drive, the, the kickoff. 24-hour live stream, yeah. The live stream, there we go. And, uh, and getting that first story in. Dave had already written the story, uh, so we were able to get that in. Uh, there was... and. And from that first issue, we didn't have a portfolio, we didn't have a company profile. Don't think we had a galactic guide overview of one of the systems. So these are things that we added uh, in the next several issues. Uh, for the January issue, Chris and I were able to work together to hammer out a template that worked for both of us. Uh, and then and it went from there. Yeah, I, it, I'm not it, sure I'm answering your question. <laughs> no, it, it 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 kind of you are, you are kind of. I'm looking at the first issue now. I have them all in iBooks on my iPad, mm -hmm. and it does have a much different format than what we're seeing today. Right. So it looks still very professional and very well done, which you know from the statement that you're making, I'm finding it even more intriguing that it came out like this. So pretty good, pretty good. Yes. Quick and dirty, getting pictures on the page, getting a some sort of a an interesting background. Uh, a lot of the text was already done. Okay. So what's the typical? Um, I don't want to say life cycle, but what typically goes into building a jump point today? Sadly, it's too similar to that. Um, okay. The uh, every month at uh, in the first week, we have what we call a kickoff, and at that point, it's uh, we have a meeting. I'm there. Chris is there. Uh, ben is there. Dave Haddock is there. Uh, Jake Rogers, uh, who I'm sorry, Jake Ross. Excuse me, Jake, uh, who sort of rides herds on herd on the artist and can can take away what we need from the artist to put the issue together. Uh, 
sit down and we schedule what each of the articles will have in it, what we, we hope will have in it. Uh, with regard to ships, sometimes it's if the ship is finished by the end of the month, this is what we'll do. If it isn't, this is what we'll fall back to. But we do that for the current month, and then we go ahead and pencil in the same schedule for the following month so that we have an idea of what we're trying to do. So first week of May, we sat down. We looked at what we had said in April about the May issue. We made whatever changes we needed to, uh, and we penciled in the June issue. Okay. Uh, so that's the first week of the month. Uh, then not a lot happens for another week or two. Uh, after a couple of weeks, I sent out a reminder that this, this, and this needs to be done by this person, this person, this person. Uh, and uh, as it gets closer, more and more of things are happening. Uh, ideally, I have all the material in a week ahead of time, which gives me a week to get the thing laid out and approved. Um, as often as not, there's an article or two that I haven't seen Friday morning, uh, and it will still get done by end of day Friday. Okay. So I, I've talked to Ben through Skype and through email at times, and he said, you know, up until like, a few hours before you guys were coming out with it that he was still working on it. Is that at all possible? A few well, hours yeah. before you come out with it? Okay. What what I do to things. Let's let's talk about that a little okay. bit. Uh, Ben's writing two articles every issue for us. Right. He's doing the Galactic Guide in the portfolio. Right. Uh, and each of those is maybe fifteen hundred words. Uh, so once he has an article written uh, sends it over to me, sends it over, uh, uh, it's also reviewed by Dave Haddock, and as uh, Rob Irving has time, Rob takes a look at it as well. Uh, Rob is tremendously busy, well, everybody is, but uh, getting Rob having time to actually review the material before we have to send it to press is sometimes bitter mess. But uh, the three of us take a look at it. Uh, I do an editing pass. Ben doesn't need much editing, but any punctuation or spelling or whatever I pick up on. Uh, but he's also doing lore, and so any facts that he puts in there, we have to sort of think about to make sure, I mean, he's done the same thing, of course. We have to sort of think about it to make sure, yes, this fits in the universe. It doesn't contradict something else we've said. Uh, we're not perfect. We sometimes let things slip. Uh, I think one of our articles recently, we moved one of the dates three centuries earlier than it should have been. Uh, but it takes me probably half an hour to, to do an editing pass on an article the length of what Ben has turned down. Okay. And uh, by that time, maybe the logo is done. Sometimes the logo is being done at the very last minute or the, uh, the system art for Galactic Guide. Uh, this isn't the case every time, but I mean, the artists say, when does this have to be in? And I tell them, I need it 15 minutes before we publish. Uh, ideally, I have it a day or a week before we publish, but if it's a piece of art, uh, there's not a lot I have to do with a piece of art besides a little formatting, which takes a couple of minutes, and getting it sized and dropped into the the space we already have waiting for it. Uh, the fiction uh, can be done a little ahead of time, so I try to get the fiction done ahead of time, but sometimes we're going back and forth over something we just discovered in the fiction that needs to be changed because it's not the way our ships are. And the players are very good about insisting that they get whatever we publish in the stories. So we, uh, we try to make sure that the stories, we've talked about this, fit the, fit the universe uh, I probably, I write my, uh, from the cockpit as I'm waiting for people to review everything else, so I have about an hour in which I can get that done. Uh, the work in progress is the biggest part of each issue, and it's the biggest task because it's taking all of these emails and comments and other threads and making sure that what images should be associated with them, 
and getting that all laid out into something that looks interesting. Okay. Can you remember an instance in the last year and a, almost a year and a half now, right? That you had to change things? Yep. What? That you had to change things on the fly the last week of publication? The answer is yes, we have had to do that. And <laughs> I'm trying to remember an instance. Uh, there's been there's been a couple three times where uh, there was uh, we don't we've we've promised with work in progress that we're not going to uh, it's just we're not going to cover a ship the completion of a ship until that ship is officially announced or officially released and there have been times when we've been all ready to deal with the work in progress article that uh, that we realize in the last week that no that ship is not going to be done by the time we release this magazine uh, and that doesn't mean I have the work in progress all laid out but it means I've collected all the pieces now that makes my task the next month somewhat easier because then I've collected most of the pieces uh, <laughs> but uh, it there are times when uh, at in that last week uh, Ben writes his articles right toward the end of of the last week and there have been two or three times just with his articles where we said oh you know we need to cover this other system rather than this one or we need to cover this other company rather than this one and so he writes a different portfolio article there was one time he wrote it turned it in we realized that's not what we needed but then we had the article for the next month all right. I had to quickly write the replacement article. At some point, um, there was a um, stretch goal that was going to give us all the jump points put into a print edition. Mm -hmm. And that just came out. Could you tell me some of the issues and some of the fun parts of getting that done? I know that there are issues, right? You've dealt with them on your end? There were issues. Okay. Uh, the issues were principally that... Um, the trying to to make sure I say this all right, we had too many pages, um, and it was longer than we anticipated. And to get it under the shipping weight, uh, that's why you're looking at a book that's so tall and has two jump point pages to the printed page. Uh, that was the only way we could figure out, and and we went round and round on. Uh, I was working with with the printer on this to figure out the best way to get the pages laid out into the book and still be within the weight limit that we had for shipping the things. Uh, that was the biggest problem. The second biggest problem was me making the foolhardy promise to include all subscriber names in the issue uh, and then making sure we got all those tracked down and realizing that there were a handful of people whose names were characters that do not occur on my keyboard. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> getting those, those in and, uh, and just making everything fit. Once, uh, and then the third issue was, was a little surprising. I had trouble actually translating it from the PDF, the electronic PDF, into a layout. We finally found a very simple solution, but it, that took considerably longer than it should have. So have you seen some of the books that had like pages that were not put in the correct order? I have heard three things. I have heard one book that had some pages missing, uh, not missing, well, one book that had some pages missing, one book that had some duplicate pages, one book where the pages were, were falling out, some of the pages were falling out. Those are three instances that I'm aware of over several thousand books. Uh, I've been trying to keep track, I've been keeping touch with, uh, with customer service. Those are the only ones that uh, awesome. I've noticed on the forum or that customer service has heard about. That's what I was trying to get to because it wasn't a lot, but you don't see that in the threads. You just see people talking about the issues. Mm -hmm. And when I did my research, it wasn't more than a couple, and you're saying it's three, which quells everyone's fears at this point, you know? Three three that I'm aware of. Okay, that's good. 
Because mine's still been sitting and shipping for the last two weeks, so I'm <laughs> waiting. <laughs> I've got my whole little above my computer. I already have my shrine with uh, the letter that Chris sent me, the pad that um, five or six of the people in uh, the LA office signed, and a couple of patches that Sandy sent me. So I've, I'm starting. <laughs> and then when I got went out there, Chris signed me one of the uh, citizen cards. I'm going to put that in there. So I've got my little shrine waiting. Waiting okay. for the book to go up there. Um, so we've talked about this a little bit about Jump Point, and I know that you're going to continue to do it. It's grown in pages, right? The pages in the beginning were not that many, and now we're up to like 60? It was 24 in that first issue. The second issue was something like 40. And everything from that point has been between 40 and 80. Yeah. So do you foresee if you're going to do printed books for now on doing them semi-annually? Probably not. Okay. I We haven't spent a lot of time discussing what our plans are with a printed jump point uh, beyond this point because we're still getting a handle on, on what the interest is. Yeah. Per personally, I'll, I'll probably have the printed one and never open it. I like reading them right here. It's always with me. It's pretty <laughs> good. Um, so you recently have started work on the economy and you're one of a many people working on that right absolutely so you're a consultant so it's not that you're in charge of the economy you're oh, coming no. in to help them i uh the the image i use is i'm the tail not the dog awesome so when i saw your little the little video talking about the economy on wingman's hangar i was intrigued to see that they brought in board game you know um the way board games work could you explain Explain to me a little bit about what was going on in that videos. That uh, well, I actually have a little show and tell on that. Okay. Also. All right. What what I did was create a a map for every system. Okay. And it wasn't every system in the game that's uh, we have about twenty five systems in this initial. Okay. And this, for example, is the map for Oso, and Oso uh, has a security level of five. And every map in the game has an inner system, and uh, the Jovian Saturn type area, and then the far out Oort Cloud type area. And there's uh, landing zones. Each of the pink things is a landing zone. Each of the blue things is a jump point. And the players move around from point to point within the system. Uh, they uh, move to the landing zones, transact uh, merchandise, they move to the jump points for obvious reasons. Uh, they run into pirates from time to time. And we're basically figuring out how much things should cost, how much what expenses should be, how much a payoff should be once you get a, a mission delivered. Just we're trying to get a handle on what the the interact what the money interactions are going to be in the game. How much it should cost if you have to replace a ship, that type thing. Okay, so how does using the old, and I would expect that the old like D&D style board games are things that you played in the past, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so how does that relate to like a game today? Like when you're, do, when you're putting this together and trying to use dice rolls and stuff, mm -hmm. how, how does that relate to the end game? to how does that relate to, to Star gonna, Citizen? Yeah, or is it just trying to come up with things that could happen along the way, like from Oso to whatever the system, I don't know, the system next to it. You're, right. you're, you're trying to work the economy out, so you're seeing what resources are there, what resources are in the other place. You're using the system security levels I would right. expect you're using the different materials that you can get in each one, resources, and, and who needs yes. what. Okay. So there's a lot more to this, and this is something that you're just basically trying to get down on paper now. Right. And and I have, in in the game that we're playing, I've assigned resources to Oso. That doesn't really mean anything about whether Oso... So we'll have those resources in the end game. It's just right. we needed a system, we needed resources, they got combined. Uh, it's a very uh, abstract version of, of the game. And it's, 
I mean, it might be neat to say, I have a paper game for Star Citizen, but this is like the playtest of any other game. It's very much a broken game. It's, we changed the rules <laughs> as we're in the middle of playing it, uh, just to, to try different things out, to try to make it closer to what the final game, the Star Citizen game will be. All uh, right. <laughs> when you were playing this game, was there alcohol involved? <laughs> There was no alcohol involved. We started okay. at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> okay. Now that sounds good because I know that um, you take a game that's based on spreadsheets like EVE and they hired a really high-level financial guy to run their economy. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you're coming on, like, you have a degree in mathematics or? Mathematics and linguistics. Which opposite poles, right? You can communicate and... <laughs> Sure, yeah. yeah. And a lot of it has to do with recognizing pattern. Good. Uh, that works with mathematics and languages. That's good. So they have the right person helping with that. But it's more than just you. The whole economy thing is being worked on by many people. That's correct? Uh, depending on how you connect it, but probably it's safe to say close to a dozen. A dozen? Is Rob uh, one of maybe, those people? Maybe not that many. It, it's depending on how you count them. Because we're talking about game designers here. We're not talking about the graphics people or anything. We're talking about the theory designers behind the game. Theory designers, but also some programming, some implementation. Okay. That's good. And, and there's a, the, the artists are actually a crucial, uh, Christine Marsh is the artist on this, and she's a crucial part of it because she's designing the interface. Oh. And if the interface doesn't work, then then none of it works. I totally forgot that. There have been some of these trading games I've tried to play, and since it was, you, you needed to be a wizard to figure out what was where and how to get it to where you needed it. That's, that's good to know. Um, so we've talked a little bit about that, and I don't want to bore people with that, because the economy is something that's not even going to be worked on until the PU, the player universe, is closer, right? Yeah, I mean, not worked on, but implemented. Like, there's no way to implement it in the game. Um, obviously, the economy won't be a key part of the dogfighting module. Right. But once you get anything broader than that, once you start having systems and reasons to fly from system to system or reasons to barricade a, a jump gate, it's because of the economy. Yes. So we talked about that. We only have a couple more questions. Um, and one of the ones that I was interested in, I started to hit on before, are there any other, any other um, guide type, jump point type things that you're working on currently that we might be seeing soon? Uh, we, we mentioned this before, the brochures uh, for each new ship, we do a 20 page brochure, uh, like a new car brochure. Like Freelancer and Connie within the next four to five months, three to four months. Sure, I certainly hope so. Okay. The uh, but I believe those are the next two up. You're right. Yeah. Uh, the uh, there are other pieces that basically won't be released till the game is released. The manual, the ship guide, uh, the making of, uh, all of those are eventually on my plate. But frankly, I've not been doing much of anything on any of them because there's not anything to be done at the time. Yeah, I, I guess not. There's uh, there's supposed to be like a compilation that's kind of like Jane's All the World aircraft for the spaceships, but that's something that you won't see until most of the spaceships have finalized variants and right. finalized ship specs. People jump for joy when ship specs were updated last week, and you know I'm cautioning people in the episode I just did that, yeah, they're done, but... They were done in October and they're already different. Just, you know, this is their way of saying this is where we're at, not right. this is where it's going to be. All I right. believe Evan Manning is the one who spent a long time working with Rob to get that all put together. Yeah, that was great. So is there anything else that you're working on that we should, you know, be looking for in the future besides Star Citizen? Because you're a consultant on this group, right? Correct. Are you doing other things for other games out there? I'm not working on any other games right now. It's, frankly, this is keeping me <laughs> fully occupied uh, between the jump point and the brochures and, and the development work. 
So your company no longer does like the Prima Guide stuff? Uh, it's been a while since we've done a guide for Prima. Uh, we did a couple of guides for, for very small games independently. Okay. Uh, but yes, it's been a while since we've done any uh, any strategy guides. We've done uh, documentation for several games. Um, at this point, uh, I just want to say thank you. I don't want to keep reaching for questions that we we went on different tangents, found better questions. So I really appreciate <laughs> you coming on. Absolutely, I enjoyed meeting you and uh, getting a chance to talk.